So hi, everyone, um, and welcome to this book discussion uh, uh, organized by Brazil Institute at King's College London. It's a great pleasure for us to have you here with us this evening, evening for London, for those who are in Brazil afternoon, and also in US could be morning included, um, for, for this book discussion. For us, it's a great pleasure to have a group of friends of the Institute and personal friends also of us, um, putting together um, a panel to, to talk with the author, uh, Matthew Taylor, the author of the book. The book is called Decadent Developmentalism, the Political Economy of Democratic Brazil. Um, it is, as I said, a, a great opportunity for us to, to share um, what we are doing in Brazil Institute, but also in partnership with other uh, friends that work with Brazil. And we have in this panel today, uh, Dr. Andresa de Souza Santos, the, the director of the Brazilian uh, program at uh, Oxford University, and also Professor Anthony Pereira, the former director of Brazil Institute, my predecessor as, as director of the Institute. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Dr. Vinicius Mariano de Carvalho, for those who don't know me, um, currently director of King's Brazil Institute. And I must say also that this, this event is an initiative of one of our PhD students, Daniel Alves, who, who will be chairing and um, moderating this panel with you today here. Um, I wish you a great discussion. I am sure that you have uh, very good topics to talk here. Uh, Matthew Taylor uh, is, um, is a very known um, uh, scholar. He studied in Brazil for quite a long time. We have had interactions in the past and was um, he great impressed, uh, impressed me greatly with his work and with his kindness to come here and talk to us today also. So thank you, Matthew, for your time and come and join us here. Thank you, Andresa and Anthony, to being part of this panel. And many, many thanks, Daniel, to putting together this panel and to chair this discussion. I will leave you now with the most interesting parts of this, this discussion today. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Vinicius. And uh, hello, everyone. My, my name is Daniel. I am a PhD student at King's. Thank you for joining us. And I really hope you are all well and, and, and safe. First things first, I'd like to say a big thank you to James Bagley and Lucy Crow for helping us to, to organize today's event. And a big thank you to, to, to Dr. Vinicius, King's Brazil Institute, and the Department of Political Economy for, for, for support, supporting us. And of course, to all uh, this, uh, to Dr. Matthew, Dr. Professor Anthony, and Dr. Andesa. We are, we are delighted to, to have you today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Matthew will present his super insightful book. We are also delighted to have Dr. And Andres and Professor, Professor Anthony uh, will offer their, their, their comments on the book. Uh, and after the presentation, the comments will have a Q&A, so you can write on, on, on the chat uh, and on the Q&A functions uh, your, your, your questions. Dr. Matthew Taylor is an associate professor at the School of International Service at American University. He's the author and co-editor of four books and a variety of articles on crime, corruption, courts, the and the political economy of development in Latin America. Dr. Taylor is also the author of Judging Policy, Courts and Poli Policy Reform in Democratic Brazil, Stanford University Press 2008. 2008 which was awarded the Brazilian Political Science Association's Victor Nunes Leal Prize for Best Book, and co-editor with Timothy Power of, uh, of Corruption and Democracy in Brazil, The Struggle for Accountability, University of Notre Dame, 2011. Dr. Andresa de Souza Santos is lecturer, course director, and director of the Brazilian Studies, Studies program, program at the Latin American Center at the University of, of Oxford. She is also a fellow at St. Anthony's College. Her research is concerned with the intersections and the dynamics between formal and informal political and economic systems. And her most recent book is The Politics of Memory, Urban Cultural Heritage in Brazil, Holland and Littlefield 2019. She is also co-editor of Urban Transformations and Public Health in the Emergent City. Manchester University Press 2020, and African Cities and Collaborative Futures Urban Platforms and Metropolitan Logistics, Manchester University Press 2021. Professor Anthony Pereira is Professor of Brazilian Studies and International Development at King's College London. 
Before joining King's in 2010, Professor Pereira held positions at the New School for Social Research in New York, the Fletcher, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University in Boston, and Tulane University in New Orleans, all in the United States, and the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. He has also been a visiting professor at the Federal, Federal University of Pernambuco in, in Recife, the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte, and the International Relations Institute at the University of São Paulo in Brazil, all in Brazil. His recent books include with Jeff, Jeff Germany, Understanding Contemporary Brazil, Who's Led 2018, and Modern Brazil, a very short introduction, Oxford University Press 2020. Thank you all again, and Dr. Matthew, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, while I get the, the screen up here, let me just say that it's a marvelous uh, opportunity to be able to share um, with you all my new book. Um, and uh, I feel very much at home uh, with the crowd at King's College. Uh, I know that, um, Danielle, we've had interactions in the past. And I really do appreciate your invitation. As Vinicius mentioned, we go back a long time. Anthony, uh, Tony Pereira, and I, I think his, his imprint is all over my work. So uh, he doesn't take any part of the blame, but uh, I'm really glad that he can be here. And um, it's wonderful to have uh, Professor Sosa Santos with us, who I didn't, haven't met in person, and I hope to meet uh, once this pandemic is behind us. But uh, really, thank you all very much. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to present to you this new book, um, which is, uh, you can see hopefully on your screen. Could you just tell me you can see it, Danielle? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so this is uh, Cambridge. It came out uh, last year. And really, I'm interested in looking at the way in which the political economy of democratic Brazil has evolved over the past generation since the return to democracy in 1985. Uh, so it's political economy, but it's also under democratic rule. And sort of the starting question for me was the extent to which uh, the country has had a very difficult time altering its governing economic paradigm. And this is despite fairly lackluster uh, economic indicators. Just to give you one measure of this, you can see here per capita income in a variety of countries. Uh, the green line there at one is Brazil's per capita income. And so what you can see here in looking across a variety of different countries is that um, most of them are catching up to Brazil, in some cases even surpassing Brazil. Uh, and this is true of both BRICS countries, Latin American countries, Asian countries, and then also the upper middle income countries, the fifth bars there, uh, which you can see are, are growing closer and closer to Brazil um, over the, the, this period. And so this is, is a little bit disturbing and particularly because the factors that might drive Brazilian growth uh, such as uh, savings, total factor productivity are either falling or in fact remaining stagnant. A second reason why I find uh, this somewhat perplexing is because there's no shortage of prescriptions for what Brazil could do better. Uh, and these prescriptions actually remain remarkably constant over time. Uh, I compare in the book a list of prescriptions from the multilateral banks in Washington in the 1980s with those that are being offered today, and the prescriptions are virtually identical. Another reason this is perplexing is because there were at least two alternative paths available to Brazil, uh, and so the equilibrium that Brazil is in is neither one of these two alternatives. One would be to deepen the developmental state, to make it a more effective developmental state. The other would be to adopt a more market-oriented alternative. I may refer to this today as the neoliberal alternative, and that is sometimes used as a pejorative term. All I mean by that is a more market-oriented path um, that, uh, that moves away from the legacy of developmentalism. A further reason why the um, persistence of this political economy equilibrium is perplexing is that Brazil has undertaken uh, 
hyperactive reform. And as you can see on the right of your screen there, in the 30 years following the 1988 Constitution, Brazil undertook just a vast number of constitutional amendments and statutory reforms uh, and implemented them at an often hyperactive pace. But they nonetheless didn't seem to add up to a paradigm shift. And so incredibly, three decades, three and a half decades after the 1988 Constitution, the Bolsonaro uh, reform agenda actually looks remarkably similar to that of his predecessors, uh, emphasizing among other things, pension reform, tax reform, civil service reform, and trade opening. So although Brazil has engaged in a variety of neoliberal reforms, they did not fully dismantle the um, structures of the developmental state. And that has enabled the developmental state apparatus to continue to be used by policymakers of both a market-oriented uh, bent and also uh, more developmentally inclined policymakers. I refer to this uh, equilibrium uh, as the title of the book gives away as de decadent developmentalism. And developmentalism has long been defined, Bielshovsky, one of the, the main um, scholars of developmentalism, who's sort of charted developmentalism over 70 years in Brazil, defines it uh, as the ideology of overcoming underdevelopment through capitalist industrialization, planned and supported by the state. Um, and so developmentalism is a set of ideas, it's a theory, it's a set of policies. Uh, and as Leslie Armijo has noted in her own work, uh, the term new developmentalism may be used to define, to identify the large degree of consensus on economic policy that has existed at least since the Kohler presidency. So there is something new about developmentalism. We're not talking about the developmentalism of the 1950s and 60s and 70s, but it is nonetheless a set of policies that really has a key uh, notion of how the state should be the inductor, the inductor of um, national development. The adjective I add to that though is decadent. And I, I chose this term um, based on the definition, luxuriously self-indulgent. And what I wanted to get at here was the failure of Brazil's political model to effectively steer private capital. So using all of the instruments of the developmental state, but failing to effectively steer um, capital in the directions that would make that develop developmental state more effective. Um, my first argument then is essentially that the Brazilian developmental state under democracy has lost the ability, if it ever had it, to accomplish the very difficult political balancing act that's required to steer capital effectively. The controls on the developmental state have not been instituted under democracy, in part because of the president's reliance on a very broad coalition uh, for political support. But also, and in tandem with that, uh, because of the corresponding weakness of oversight agencies and of the judicial branch as enforcers of the boundary between states, the state and firms. Uh, this has meant that it's been very difficult for the Brazilian developmental state as it exists today to actually develop and maintain the capacity for strategic planning and for strategic control over public policies. So to kind of summarize grossly, I think the main contribution of the book here is that technical understanding is insufficient and that politics to understand the economic paradigm that governs Brazil politics really matters. So to get at that, um, the sort of theoretical framework that drives this book is that of institutional complementarity. And those of you who are acquainted with the varieties of capitalism literature will be well acquainted with theories of institutional complementarity. My argument is simply that all of the phenomena that I described to you earlier, the failure to refurbish the developmental state, the failure to reach a new market-oriented paradigm, the hyperactive, hyperactivity of reform, all of them have the same source. And it's this institutional complementarity and the way in which these five domains that are on your screen 
are actually complementary amongst themselves. And one of the problems is that because social scientists typically study organizations in isolation, we study political parties, we study bureaucracies, we study firms, we study Congress, but we seldom step back to think about how do those organizations actually drive diverse actors toward a common equilibrium. And I think um, that the contribution of the institutional complementarity literature is simply to point to the fact that different institutional domains are intricately intertwined. They are intricately intertwined in ways that are non-random and that provide a, con a contextual logic for economic and political action. So I'm gonna talk briefly about each of these domains and how they relate in between, in between themselves the book, uh, as Daniel pointed out, is, is dense. Um, and so I apologize that I'm only, only gonna hit some of the highlights of each of the, the five domains that we're talking about here. So in the macroeconomic sphere, uh, I think the, the starting point is what I call the fiscal imperative. As we look back at the last 35 years of Brazilian democracy, the spending commitments that were established by the 1988 constitution the redistributive pressures of democracy itself, the trauma of hyperinflation, and the deep need for foreign investment have all created what I call the fiscal imperative. The need for the federal government to focus on maintaining spending within fairly tight constraints. This contributes to two factors, or two facts. One is just an incredible increase over time in tax revenue. The Brazilian state has been enormously effective in boosting tax uh, income, but it does so in ways that are highly regressive. The second, though, is, is political in nature, and that's sort of the dirty secret of the Brazilian presidency. And you can see it on the left-hand side of your screen. If you look at the circled, this is the basically the big items in the budget. If you look at um, the, the circled custeio e investimento, this is the area of the budget that uh, is discretionary for the president to spend at his or her discretion without a lot of oversight. And the, the kind of dirty secret here is that this is where investment should take place, but it's squeezed both by uh, social spending on the one hand and um, uh, also by subsidies on the other. And so that leaves very little room for the federal government to actually uh, invest. And this has led to, um, what, uh, to, to low public sector investment, which contributes to low growth, and essentially means that as Samuel Pessoa, an economist in Brazil has pointed out, growth is a residual in Brazil. It also leads uh, to very strong incentives for fiscally opaque spending. That is spending uh, that takes place off of the fiscal bottom line that doesn't appear as clearly in the budget items. And um, one way uh, that this is this happens is through the use of developmental state institutions. Why? Because the developmental state, many of the policies that are carried out by those institutions don't have a direct impact or only have an opaque impact. That is a hard to uh, view impact on the budgetary bottom line. So I'm thinking here about industrial policies, about uh, lending, tax credits, uh, cross shareholding, regulatory assistance, selective protections. All of these are tools that are made possible by the developmental state uh, and offer kind of a compensatory policy making uh, space for the executive branch. The final uh, consequence here is a reliance on foreign investment. And um, because the state is unable to really make up the investment shortfall, it often does what it can to attract foreign investment into Brazil. But this is paradoxical because at the end of the day, a developmental state would presumably want to privilege national firms. And what's happening is that foreign firms, once they come into Brazil are treated essentially, not entirely, but essentially uh, like national firms. All right, so that's the first domain. The second domain is microeconomic. And here uh, I rely very heavily on Ben Ross Schneider's theory, 
uh, basically the variety of capitalism that he describes for Latin America as the hierarchical market economy. And as you can see, uh, this is on the right, if you look at this graph, this is a graph of the 519 largest firms in Brazil by sector. And I pulled this together using uh, Revista Exame, uh, which does a regular um, uh, collection on, on Brazilian firms. Uh, if, you, if you look at this, you'll see that we see very strong confirmation of one element of Schneider's hierarchical market capitalism. And that is that Brazilian firms, if you look from steelworks and metallurgy here, this middle column, all the way to the right to textiles, these are areas in which Brazilian firms dominate. And so uh, what you'll see there is with a couple minor exceptions, but, but we can talk about those exceptions later, uh, these are sectors uh, in which Brazilian firms dominate, but they're low complexity. Uh, they tend to be commodities driven. They tend to be labors, labor intensive, but not skills intensive. And so as uh, Schneider and his co-author Donner have pointed out, this means that there aren't very many incentives for Brazilian firms to uh, act uh, or to engage in collective action. That is to create an upgrading coalition for reform. And uh, so what we get, I think, uh, as a consequence of that lack of political action is uh, firm segmentation that drives labor segmentation. That is the more skilled workforce is on the left-hand side of this graph, the less skilled um, high turnover uh, workforce is on the right-hand side of the graph. And, um, also, as, as a consequence of the lack of an upgrading coalition, there's not much of a push for education reform, for stricter labor regulation, and we get the regressive policies and sort of the low productivity policies uh, that those would suggest we would see. Where Brazil is a little bit different from the rest of Latin America is has, has much to do with the developmental state. And so one of the major differences is that there's less diversification among Brazilian conglomerates. That is, few Brazilian conglomerates actually have their own bank in the way that Chileans, uh, Chile's conglomerates, for example, uh, often do. And one of the reasons for that is because of the existence of huge amounts of state-run credit. Uh, there's also more state involvement in Brazil through developmental institutions like the National Development Bank. Um, and there's also this unique form of firm organization that Musacchio and Lazzarini refer to as networked capitalism. And so um, as they have shown, even though uh, the Brazil privatized more than hundred billion dollars of firms during the 1990s, the state still has a role both through majority owned state owned enterprises uh, such as uh, uh, Banco do Brasil, through enterprises that it controls via a golden share, such as Petrobras, or through minority shareholding, uh, including over ostensibly private sector companies. All right, so let me move now to the third domain. And basically, if firms um, are facing a lot of influence by the state, it's somewhat natural to assume that they will uh, seek to influence the state in their own right. And what we, what the book tries to point out uh, is that the highly fragmented political system in Brazil opens up many veto points, and that permits what I call defensive parochialism. Rather than engaging in upgrading coalitions, firms are able to engage in defensive parochialism, defending their own sectoral or firm interests uh, against change. And so you can see here, uh, this is a, a pie chart of the Brazilian Congress. This is actually from 2010, but it doesn't, it looks even more fragmented today. And the way in which this is held together, as other scholars have pointed out, uh, is through the presidential toolkit. And the presidential toolkit enables a certain amount of legislation to get through, but it's unable on its own to guarantee the full cooperation of all of the members of the coalition. And I would argue more importantly, it has a number of um, 
trade-offs. That is, it generates a number of um, costs. So one of the most important of these are the informal exchange of coalition goods. And um, in keeping with the sort of institutional complementarities argument, I wanna focus on those coalitional goods that are derived from the developmental state apparatus. So whether it's credit, whether it's government appointments, um, whether it's special policies, all of these uh, are often derived and only made possible uh, in a constrained fiscal environment by the developmental state. And if you look at the outside of this uh, slide, you'll see what I refer to as brokers um, who are sort of the people who know, for lack of a better term, where the bodies are buried. Every government uh, in Brazil has had one of these brokers, uh, at least one of these brokers. And oftentimes they're the ones who keep track of what the mechanisms of reciprocity are. Uh, seldom do we see kind of a quid pro quo exchange. I'll give you a campaign donation in exchange for um, this or that, but rather uh, we, there's kind of a running tally of um, where uh, the state has acted on behalf of firms and where firms have acted on behalf of particular administrations. And this would not necessarily be a, a terrible thing, except that, as I want to point out, controls and particularly uh, controls through accountability are very weak uh, at the federal level. So uh, as we think about as we think about accountability and we think about both vertical accountability through the electoral system and horizontal accountability across branches, this really comes into play. Vertically, the electoral system really makes it very hard for voters to control their representative. Horizontally, the coalitional presidential system makes it makes, creates very few incentives for one branch to check the other. And while there have been a number of agencies that have given have been given great much greater power to control, um, you know, the legislature or individual legislators, uh, the fact of the matter is they are often populated at their apex by members of the coalition. And so this makes it very difficult for them to actually, um, uh, they have very few incentives to oversee each other and therefore um, seldom do it. And this leads to a pattern of political interaction that is inefficient, I would argue suboptimal. It drives up the cost of politics. It dilutes the coherence of policy initiatives. It requires costly side payments and it tends to only permit incremental change. But there are a variety of reasons why it survives. And uh, among these are, it provides key interest groups with defense against change. That's defensive parochialism. It provides executives with support in a fragmented legislative system. It provides legislative incumbents with uh, the tools for political survival. And it enables incumbent firms to outcompete their potential rivals. Now, the, one of the consequences of this though, leads me to the fourth domain, and that is weak controls. And for the political economists among you, you'll be well acquainted with the concept of controls, both legal, um, administrative, political controls that essentially uh, need to be imposed by a state, whether it's a developmental state or a neoliberal state, to ensure that the rents that are accruing to private sector actors actually lead to some sort of reciprocity. That is, if you provide a rent, such as in a neoliberal state, intellectual protection, you know, trademark protection, that you get as a consequence something in return. And it might be, you know, uh, a, a block against oligopoly or monopoly power. In a developmental state, this might look like rents such as particular public policies and in exchange uh, a commitment to invest heavily in shipbuilding or to invest heavily in uh, new innovation in your particular sector. And so 
I show in the book uh, four different case studies that you'll see here, the, the free trade zone of Manaus, the Brazil, Plano Brasil Maior under Dilma Rousseff, um, the automotive regime over the past 30 years, and the ethanol regime, which has actually been in place since the 1970s. And what we see is that the rents that the state provides to Brazilian private sector firms are gigantic. Uh, in some years, uh, tax breaks and credit subsidies reached 6% of GDP. Loans from state-owned banks in some years cleared 11% of GDP. And then you have a variety of less quantifiable market protections, uh, investments by domestic rules and so forth that uh, we can't quantify by definition, but that nonetheless have not been matched by reciprocity. That is, they have not led to the desired outcomes. And as the case studies try to point out, um, there, there are a number of, of factors that are driving this. One is a lack of strategic direction and coordination because of the process of coalition formation. The difficulty in evaluating the costs and benefits of these policy regimes, in part because of the use of fiscally opaque tools, Third, uh, multiple access points, which as Edmund Amman has pointed out, lead to a weakening of regulatory uh, oversight or regulatory autonomy. Uh, and then also a real imbalance between oversight bodies like the Tribunal de Contas uh, and the actual recipients of um, these rents. And so all of these factors and several others that I describe in the book dilute effective control. All right, so at this point, um, I, I hope that you're not pulling out your hair and saying this is a very depressing argument, but uh, you may be saying, wait a second, it, what we've seen in Brazil has not been as bad as you seem to be claiming. And in fact, you know, we've seen the Real Plan, which was a huge step forward. We saw Bolsa Familia, which is an, or, an enormous gain in terms of social policy and so forth. Remember, though, that the argument here is not that change is not possible, but simply that there seems to be a constant return to equilibrium. Uh, and so it's not an argument about two steps forward, one step back. It's that even the steps forward tend to, at some point, return to an institutional equilibrium, which means that a broader paradigm shift is hard. Now, we do see these steps forward. And the fifth domain is really where I see many of the sources of change coming from. And that's the autonomous bureaucracy. The civil service is in many ways, as Anthony, uh, Tony Pereira has pointed out, an outcome of the very success of the developmental state over seven decades, right? That the, the civil service has developed over time partly because of the success of the developmental state in its early uh, decades. Uh, in under democracy, the civil service has been extraordinarily important in carrying forward many uh, policy initiatives. I list here three that I discuss in the book, the response to HIV AIDS, uh, fiscal reform and anti-corruption reforms. And I chose those purposely because they're so different from each other. And what we see in each of those is that because the civil service is powerful, uh, well-paid, high capacity in many cases, and most importantly, responds to so many different principles that it in fact has very few principles. That is, it, it, you know, there's kind of a collective action problem among principles that make it very difficult for legislators or uh, the executive branch itself to control uh, all elements of the policy of the bureaucracy. And so that allows this active civil service to smuggle through uh, policy initiatives under the eyes sometimes of its principles. The, the paradox here, of course, is that um, this, this leads to gains on the one hand, it contributes to some of the social uh, and economic policy gains that we've seen over the course of the past generation, but it also contributes both to the fiscal imperative in the macroeconomic domain and to the kind of compensatory flywheel of policy that we see in the microeconomic domain. So to, to wrap up here, um, you know, many people thought that Bolsonaro would represent an enormous change and he clearly campaigned on um, 
uh, with a coalition that, that really represented change in a variety of different domains. The one in which he seemed to promise the most change though was uh, the economic domain. And you see here his super powerful uh, economics minister, Paulo Guedes, who is a Chicago PhD, that is he's a Chicago boy, uh, that is a neoliberal of the most radical sort. Remember that Guedes railed not just against Dilma Rousseff and her lack of reform, but he also railed against Fernando Henrique Cardoso and his lack of uh, policy reform. So, you know, there were many reasons to believe that under Bolsonaro, uh, the equilibrium might shift. And I think there's still a possibility that it will shift um, for a variety of reasons. But at the same time, what we see is that the equilibrium in some ways does continue to reassert itself. And there are many possible examples I could give you, but let me offer three examples in which the equilibrium seems to re be reasserting itself. The first is in the political domain. Uh, we saw with Bolsonaro 243 new members of the 513 member lower house. So a real um, out with the bums movement in the last election. And Bolsonaro came into office saying, I don't wanna play coalitional politics. And yet within six months, uh, he was back to the old game of coalitional politics. He had distributed a bevy of sub-ministerial appointments who, uh, that were best known because they controlled uh, nearly uh, 75 billion reais in spending. And he did that so as to have the support of the so-called Centrón. A second example is the reform that Geddes sought of regulatory agencies. And remember that the regulatory agencies had been established largely under neoliberal reforms undertaken in the 1990s, but gradually lost their autonomy over time. And so he sought a reform to increase their autonomy, at which point Bolsonaro exclaimed, what, do they want me to be the queen of England? And all of you are in London and know better than I what that means. But basically my understanding is he was afraid of becoming ceremonial only and not having the capacity to actually control policy. Um, and then finally, Geddes went to the Zona Franca de Manaus and he complained vehemently in a, in a speech that got all sorts of press coverage about how the Zona Franca, the free trade zone of Manaus was messing up Brazil. Within a couple of months, he was back in Manaus signing millions, almost a hundred million dollars in new financing for the free trade zone and saying, we're not going to target the heart and the essence of Brazilian regional development. So let me conclude here just by saying, I don't think we can understand the history of the past generation of Brazilian democracy without reference to these interlocking or these complementary institutional domains of the political economy uh, and the strong incentives that they generate and particularly the strong incentives they generate for weak control over state policy. And this makes it very difficult for Brazil to engage in radical reform. And that may be a good thing in the long haul, but it also means that it's very difficult to create either a more effective developmental state or a more effective market alternative. So I'll wrap it up here. I'd love to hear uh, your comments and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Matthew. That was really amazing. Uh, I will I will go now to Dr. Andresa, then to Professor Anthony, and then I return to for your for your comments. So, Dr. Andresa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have the chance to comment on this amazing book. I read it over uh, the holidays and uh, it, it was really nice. It was really good companionship to read this book. Um, yeah, so I guess I have 10 minutes. So I'll be, uh, I'll try to be quick because it's a very dense book and there are so many points that I would like to highlight. And the first thing, uh, Matthew, is that I thought was to discuss what this book is about. And obviously you just did that, but I also think 
that it's good to know what other key points other people get from from reading your book. So I'm not gonna jump um, this question. I'm gonna give myself the exercise to really synthesize what um, this book was about for me. And when I, I read the book, I, I was thinking about this very beginning when you talk about some strategies in Brazilian development that could have been individually best, but they were collectively suboptimal. And we can't avoid thinking about game theories and even the pandemic now, which is uh, a moment when we see how um, individual decisions may be very suboptimal collectively. And how, and how did we get here in, in a country that has um, had a return to democracy in 1985 and um, has had so many progress socially, but then has an economic performance that is very middle ground, sometimes as you say, like going some steps back and, and how to unfold all these examples of, of situations that were not collectively best for for Brazil. And then, and then this book for me, when you talk about this equilibrium and, um, and the development choices in Brazil, the, I was very much thinking about um, this discussion that you bring right in the introduction about some suboptimal collective decisions and how those decisions were made in institutional ways and um, in the, from the perspective of businesses, but also um, politics. And you bring all this together and it's um, complex and you do it beautifully. Um, yeah, so some of these economic policies that are, that are discussed in the book, they have now really privileged redistribution and to understand why is very, is very important and also to understand what it causes in terms of economic growth that may not really um, benefit the community in general, but it may benefit some oligo oligopolistic firms and, um, and how growth can be sustainable in Brazil or why it is not sustainable in Brazil. So some of these lock-ins and this past dependence that are discussed are very important, especially because we know that sometimes we can think this is a a political problem and political scientists are always discussing this executive and legislative kind of balance while economies are discussing the role of politics and the economy while and this book actually brings all of this together and tries to complexify and nuance those relationships. So I thought um, this was a little bit of what it uh, revealed, but um, I think there is more when I um, discuss your book that I want to engage with. And um, I'd like to bring um, to you, but also to everyone in the audience. And I was checking who is there. And I know a lot of the people who, who are listening today. So um, what this book dialogues and um, what stood out in the book for me that uh, really made me learn something very new and to think about my own research was actually when I was reading chapter four of your book. And for those who didn't read it, um, chapter four will bring uh, an explanation of what uh, Matthew talk about capitalismo de laços or uh, capitalism of shared ties. And I was thinking about this concept uh, in relation to my own research. So, when uh, I, I'm a political ethnographer, Matthew, so I come from political science, but then I shift to anthropology because I want to do an ethnography. And I spend a lot of time in the field learning about um, licensing for mining companies. And when, when, what I saw in Minas Gerais in Brazil was that in some of these licensing uh, processes, you had a very skillful public service very capable uh, public servants to discuss uh, the issue of pollution, deforestation, and so on. You also had a very um, strong civil society and community leaders were very capable to discuss the impact of some of these businesses um, in their community, in their houses. And yet you also saw these 
um, very important business in town that nobody wants to openly oppose to because that's their main chance of, of jobs and so on. So there is this reservation in, in directly confronting the main job owner in, in town. Right. And when I was I was always thinking about economic diversification that in that lens, which is um, there is not a very strong economic diversification. You have municipalities that are export commodities and they're very focused on on that one businesses. But um, your your book actually opened my horizons because you not only talk about this lack of economic diversification in terms of commodities and so on, but also how some of these firms, they don't diversify their businesses. And then they, they have a very strong focus on, on one baseline, like a mining company that the only does mining and, and so on and so forth. And then also how um, these companies, they protect each other in, in this capitalism de lassos and how they will sit on, on, on their um, boards for decision and exchange influence and, and so on. So this, this ties and, and these connections and, um, and combined with these companies being state champions and also getting some privilege in taxes and, um, and developmental banks can, can do that. And, and so it was really uh, overwhelmingly uh, informative on how difficult it becomes to then change some of these structures. And I think your book really tries to answer or discuss um, how we can control these elites when the elites, they are combined, they're together and they're sharing um, ties and some of these political privileges. And then it, uh, this chapter also discuss some of the facts of, of this, this ties, which can bring um, inefficiency, but an inefficiency that can be very defensive and can be defensive against change. And then we can have uh, a system that doesn't bring innovation, that doesn't bring um, better labor, that can still push some small businesses and some people into informality and perpetuate the cycle of inequalities that we, that we see in Brazil. And when, when we think about the power of democracy and the power of accountability of those institutions, it, there is very little space for being naive because um, as I was saying in the beginning, and that's how this chapter made me think about my own research and made me think about Brazil in many ways, is that uh, you can think of some institutions that actually work well or like civil society or mechanisms of participation, but we can never underestimate the impact of inequality in having a very good functioning of those institutions. And so when you have a system that feeds into inequality, then you, you can perpetuate some of these relationships that will, um, that will make the, the good functioning of institutions very difficult. And, um, and so to, to finish some of my comments here, I also asked myself while reading your book, how um, your work um, is situated in the overall research about Brazil nowadays. And I think uh, for anyone studying um, Brazilian political economy, this book's a must read because from imports substitution industrialization to social programs like Bolsa Familia, you can understand what Brazil's poor receive in social benefits, but also what they spend in taxes and really understand some of the choices made. But uh, also politically, the book unpacks uh, main important ideas and concepts that are, uh, allow us to understand political economy in Brazil. And I think there are two sentences in the book that summarize very well some of these uh, political discussions. One is, é dando que se recebe, 
that is discussed in the book, which goes back to these elite times and how they can favor each other to then receive some other favors back and, and this and the self-fulfilling cycles of um, giving to then receive. Um, another sentence that I think is very interesting to the political discussion is this idea of uh, criando dificuldades para vender facilidades that is also in the book and how, and, and this is in the discussion a bit of um, party fragmentation and uh, presidentialism of coalition and how um, there are some all these difficulties in creating majorities, but also how um, this can be solved with some pacts and, 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 and we know the stories of political corruption in Brazil. So this is all very well discussed in the book, well exemplified. And um, in the, to not finish, so hopeless, and I know in your presentation you also uh, mentioned public service. I, I thought this is when the book gives a little bit of um, tools to, to think ahead uh, again, here, there is no space for naivety, and it's not uh, a very optimistic um, discussion of Brazilian bureaucracy, but it does show that a well-equipped, a well-numbered, and a well-paid public service can do wonders in, in the country, and, and how to achieve this balance and, and to have that is very important. And bureaucratic activism or uh, well-functioning bureaucracy, I think is a very hot topic in Brazil these days. We, we know from Ricardo Galvão, the very beginning of Bolsonaro's government, who was fired for talking about, for releasing numbers of uh, deforestation in Brazil. So you start having from then on, but also a bit before that, this discussion of people who are being fired for doing their job. And then we have this whole discussion of uh, keeping the job or doing the job and how um, bureaucratic activism will, will have a, a say in Brazil or how these actors are gonna do the work. And um, I was reading um, the other days all the, the findings from the weapons of the week and all these issues of procrastination uh, and how do you do you fight back when, when you have functions like if you are working in an environmental ministry that is mainly uh, destroying the environment, what, what becomes your job? To not do your work or to do your work? And you know, or when you work in the Minister of Health that is denying the pandemic and then what becomes your task as a public servant? And so some of the, these discussions, and I very much recommend in chapter seven to learn about what Brazil was, what Brazil could be, and also to think about what Brazil is becoming in terms of, of public service in Brazil. So this book's very um, important, and, and this discussion is, is very important in the book. And so, uh, on the conclusion and some of the main topics of the book is, of, of course, how, um, how can we control these elites that are um, joint economic and, and political elites? And of course, this is a very big challenge and this is not a very normative book and this is what you do now. But um, I think Matthew set himself a very big task to discuss some of these issues of elites and these joint elites and these complexities of the political and economic um, state in Brazil, offering what is a historic political economic uh, approach for these discussions. And, and I also think there are some aspects of the book that can uh, create alternatives and can help us think about uh, what to do when you give examples of um, some policies on HIV and again on public service. So, so I think the book does bring um, a couple of examples that create hope. Um, so those are in short my takes and I'm looking forward to Anthony's uh, points and to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ambeza. Uh, Professor Anthony, over, over to you. Thank you. Um, Matt, really enjoyed reading the book. 
Um, I hope you can come back physically to London at some point after this wretched pandemic. Um, I think your book, um, it is definitely an antidote to all of those overly enthusiastic tomes that we all know about, you know, Brazil on the rise, the new Brazil starting over, Brazil in transition, all those things. So there's so many passages in the book that I want my students to read. Um, and to me, one of its importance, one of the aspects of it that's really important is what Andresa was saying, that, you know, growth is important, even if you're not a macroeconomic geek, because growth is the engine that is, it could, can, um, can, ad can help policymakers address inequality, right? Under, under democratic condi conditions, if you're not talking about uh, state seizure of assets and a revolutionary situation, you need growth to redistribute. And, and you know, improving on the very modest gains of the 2000s when there was a, there was a decline in income inequality, right? It's, it's contested how much it was, but there was some, maybe leaving wealth aside, but there was real progress there. And that's been stopped, as you show in the book, it it's hasn't kept on going. So, so growth is really important. And I, I, wanna, I wanna ask three questions. One question about the decadent in your title, one question about the developmentalism in your title, and one question about the conclusion. So I hope that's an easy way to remember those because it's just unpacking your title. So I think you're very good at sticking to your methodology. You're a dispassionate, in fact, cynical and hard boiled soft rational choice institutionalist, right? So um, you're, you're looking at outcomes and you say to us, uh, institutions don't act, right? They don't have a personality, we can't judge them uh, normatively. This, this, is an out, this is an equilibrium that's the result of people being rational and just doing what's in their best interest. Occasionally though, this civic minded good citizen comes out on the page, <laughs> despite most of the analysis being very hard boiled. So you say on, on page um, 226, the civil service is not always public regarding. Well, yeah, you've already told us that they're not going to be public, you know, they're going to pursue their own interests. Business lobbying is not focused on collective action for the purposes of reducing economy wide efficiencies. Okay, we've, we, we know that. Um, so the title the title could just be interpreted as decline or relative decline. That, sorry, the decadent part. Um, but as you say, it's also got a normative judgment. It's luxuriously self-indulgent. I read in another context that it's decay in standards, morals, dignity, religious faith, honor, discipline, skill. It's pretty pejorative. And if we want to take the micro foundation seriously, is that do we want to have that judgment in there? And I say that because there's a strand in literature on Brazil that's very pessimistic, that takes Brazil's very origins as some kind of original sin. And I call that, I've called that in another context, luso pessimism. So, you know, oh God, Portugal, it had the Inquisition longer than anybody else. It didn't have an enlightenment. It never industrialized. It was backward. It was priest ridden. What a, what a terrible country to be the colonial power. Of course, you know, largest slave, slave holding society in the world in the 19th century will never, you know, sometimes I think unwarranted pessimism about Brazil. So the, I'm, I'm, I do have a question in here, <laughs> don't worry. But um, so you establish the, the decadence or you, you establish the re relative decline of Brazil as a middle income country in relation to, um, the stats on, on lots of other countries in that category. But if you were going to do a qualitative case study comparison, right, could be a next step for your research. Uh, who, do, who do you compare Brazil with? Which country do you sensibly compare Brazil with? What's the basis for being pessimistic? Is it other countries in the region? Is it large countries that are very inward looking like India? Um, you know, one of the cliches about people who study corruption is, how do you get to Denmark? Well, well, what's Denmark in, in, this, in this paradigm? Uh, where can Brazil 
profitably look for policy arbitrage. I remember when the PT first got in 2002, they had some studies on South Korea and how many, you know, how many patents South Korean firms were, were, were applying for, what the education system was like in, in, in Korea. It, is that reasonable? So, the, so, the, so that's a question about, about who, you know, which countries to, com to reasonably compare Brazil with to, to, get a, to get at this notion of decline and, how, and how, how singular it is, I guess. The other thing is developmentalism. And this came to me because I looked at your article called Continuity Through Change, Developmentalism and Neoliberalism Brazil. Could you have called the book Decadent Neoliberalism? Okay, I'm, I'm being provocative, but some people would call it that. I mean, my friend uh, and colleague, Alfredo Sad Filho, calls the Lula period developmental neoliberalism, right? And sometimes I think of the Brazilian state as, as like the Push Me Pull You in the Dr. Doolittle book. If you ever look at that book, not the film, because they ruined it in the film, but the Push Me Pull You in the book is part gazelle, part unicorn with one head on each end of the body. Um, so is it, a, is it a gazelle or is it a unicorn? I think when you look at the Brazilian state, is it neoliberal? Is it, is it developmentalist? You can kind of go either way. You, you, you acknowledge in the book that at the macro level, there are a lot of features of it that look very neoliberal. The tripe is a floating exchange rate, inflation targeting primary fiscal surplus. Looks pretty orthodox. You know, Brazilian policymakers wanna enter the OECD. That looks pretty orthodox. Um, you, you probably would never expect a large economy like Brazil's to go full on orthodox neoliberal free market reform, unless maybe you were tied to the hip with an Anglo-American country like, the, like Mexico is to the United States. So if you look at other big economies, Russia, India, they tend to resist full on orthodox neoliberal reform. Um, but you also have on the so if you if you think of this ledger, um, you mentioned Celso Furtado, but Brazil is, and we tend to think of developmentalists when we think of Brazilian economic thinkers: Tiotono dos Santos, Caio Prado Jr., Cardoso himself. But you've got Roberto Campos, Mario Henrique Simonson, Marcos Lisboa, Gustavo Franco. You've got a lot of liberal economists, right? And if you think of the presidents since, not counting Sarney because he's a bit of a blip, but if you start with Collor de Mello, you've got Collor de Mello, Cardoso, Temer, and Bolsonaro, who roughly identify with a neoliberal reform package. And then you've got Gilma and Lula, who don't. So if it's kind of macro neoliberal, micro developmentalist, what is it really? And I say this because I've edited a book with developmental economists, including Bresser Pereira, and they do not call this model their own, right? They, they, don't, they are not embracing it and saying, ah, this is a fulfillment of all the things we want. They hate the, all kinds of aspects of it, right? Including at that time when I did the book, an overvalued, what they thought was an overvalued exchange rate that was killing manufacturing. Um, so that's just a provocative question. So my last question is on the conclusion. Um, and I like the conclusion a lot because I think you, you restrain yourself and you say, well, look, it's kind of stuck. I, I, I sense, and this may be a completely wrong interpretation, I sense that, because um, you say, okay, you can't really do the developmental state because that's Japan and Taiwan and South Korea and Brazil's never gonna be, do that. Um, if they just took the, the sensible World Bank prescriptions and if people could see all of the distortions that the state is uh, imposing on the economy, they could embrace a, a rollback of the state and its replacement with competitive markets. And wh why the hell don't do the, they don't they do that? So I, I kind of got a sense in your conclusion that you were that you were wishing for Brazil to get off the fence and and stop this push me pull you stuff. Um, but I I would say that what I wanted to see a bit more of in the conclusion was more IPE because. What you might be doing there, I felt a little bit that it was a false dichotomy in the sense that Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, they did most of their heterodox developmental state stuff in, a, in an earlier period, before 1980, when Latin America was doing ISI. Nobody wants to go back to ISI, but they also can't recreate that, those policies of the developmental state. China, on the other hand, China has kind of tweaked the whole developmental state model, and it's been much more open 
right? It exposed its companies to much more competition and much less tariff protection than did those earlier East Asian NICs, and more so than Brazil. And so if you, and I also think that if you go beyond the prescriptions of the World Bank and look at how neoliberalism was actually implemented in the sort of emblematic countries. So take, take Pinochet's Chile, Carlos Salinas de Gortari in Mexico, and Carlos Menem in Argentina. Um, those, you know, and Barbara Stallings has written about this. Those don't look like wonderful <laughs> reforms in many ways. You know, the actual results of those were um, not, you know, not fantastic on growth, widening inequality, the concentration of a bunch of fat cats who were politically connected, despite the fact that there was much more market than before, not much poverty reduction, uh, financial and economic volatility, and a decline in state capacity. So my own prejudice, I guess, is that Brazil has to somehow transcend this dichotomy between the historical developmental states of Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. That's gone. They've missed that train. I think they also have to resist the, to me, absolutely extreme and crazy. You call them extreme. I agree. Get us approach, which is, you know, he want, he claimed that he was going to get to fiscal, uh, re remove the fiscal deficit entirely in the first year of the Bolsonaro government. He wants to destroy a permanent employment for all civil servants. You know, he wants to privatize pensions along the Chilean model, and people in Chile are absolutely fed up with that. <laughs> you know, they, they're, they're probably going to eliminate that in the Constitutional Assembly. So to transcend somehow and find a new, new developmentalism. I, I doubt if that will catch on as a phrase, but I'm just throwing it out there. Something, and, and so, the, so the final question here is, are these large paradigms of developmentalism and neoliberalism perhaps even getting in the way of our, of our search for tools? Because let me just give you, let me just end with this one example, because I, I, I think that the, the world has moved in a non-neoliberal direction, at least since the financial crisis. You know, you've got the rise of China with its alternative approach. And if you look at the coronavirus, you, you'd think that policymakers in Brazil are looking at their economy and saying, you know, we need at the minimum to develop vaccine manufacturing capacity, right? Because, you know, the neoliberals will say, well, it doesn't matter if you produce it nationally, just import it. Well, big pharma doesn't produce vaccines unless it's, unless it's kind of pushed to do so. Um, the rich countries are not donating their vaccines until they until they vaccinate their own population. That's you know that's kind of what you'd expect of them. So in the, whether you're neoliberal or developmentalist, if you don't have your own capacity, um, you're stuck. You know you're probably independent of your of your of your ideological preferences. You probably want some capacity there, and that's an example of IP being a big factor. You know, that's that's the situation room of the pandemic, but also uh, the trends given the rise of China. I could you could you could talk about other examples. US policy towards rare earth metals, for example. They're trying to have a national supply chain in that. There's this obsession now with with having national control over supply chains, which is totally different from the years of the neoliberal orthodoxy in the 80s and 90s. So I guess the last question, I mean I know I'm I'm not making much sense here at this point, and I'm going to stop. But if you had to bring IPE into that last chapter, what what are the elements that that matter for you in in terms of policy choice? Thank you very much, Professor Anthony. We have some some questions already. Uh, yep, uh, Dr. Matthew, if you would like to to comment, please. Then we we go to the questions. Thanks. Okay, uh, these are these are really fantastic comments and um i'm not going to be able to do justice to all of them uh but let me let me go in the order that they were presented and just say that andresa you were incredibly generous and charitable as a particularly as a political ethnographer uh in reading and commenting on this because as anthony pointed out i am a, a soft rational choice institutionalist and and somewhere uh, probably, you know, you're down in the dirt, and I'm I'm up there, kind of floating around, just uh, thinking about grand ideas. Um, and I really do appreciate your kind of drawing out some of the things that you found interesting and useful um, in such a charitable way. I 
I, the question that you asked that I really want to respond to, which I think actually goes to both of your comments, is the question of how to control elites. And I ultimately, you know, when you write a book, you write it and then you, <laughs> it goes out and it goes through multiple iterations and you all know the process as well as I do and it's painful. And then it's only after it comes back and you sit down and you pick up your copy and you start to read through it and you go, darn it, I missed the point, right? <laughs> and I don't think I missed the point, but there are many, well, I hope I didn't miss the point, but I, I certainly think that there are many places where I would have changed the emphasis or really heightened the emphasis. And so you put your finger, Andres, on a really important point, which is at the end of the day, whether we're talking neo-developmentalism or neoliberalism or some weird mix of these things, the politics of Brazilian political economy comes down to the question of how we control elites and the way in which this political system um, in many ways, I think, uh, makes it very difficult to overcome, as you pointed out, Andres, uh, it, it makes it very difficult to overcome kind of the residual regressiveness of Brazilian society. And that kind of goes to Anthony's point also about um, whether this is a path dependent problem that goes back in history to the legacies of slavery. And I, I you know, in the book, I try to make the point that um, ultimately, I'm not trying to say that path dependence doesn't exist, but the nice thing about a concept of institutional complementarity, the, the, the theoretical construct of institutional complementarity is it doesn't suggest that you're necessarily stuck on a particular path for all time. And I, I go to great lengths that I didn't go to in the talk in the book, I, I go to great lengths to try to say, well, you know, there is the possibility that the accumulation of change in various domains could actually lead to abrupt change in the institutional equilibrium. And so this is very different from path dependence, which would suggest that you can't get off of one path and go to another path. Uh, I, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. What I think we know from a big literature on policy incrementalism in Brazil and the fact that most change that happens in Brazil, whether it's policy change or institutional change, all of it happens in incremental ways. There are very few examples that we could offer of kind of big bang institutional change in the Brazilian case. Uh, but that's not to say that incremental change over time couldn't accumulate into a major change. Um, now, you know, I, I'm working on a, on a different manuscript right now on corruption, which goes to Andres's question about one aspect of controlling elites. And my sense is that one of the problems of Lava Jato was in fact that it tried to do too much too quickly, that you had the accumulation of incremental change over 25, 30 years. And then beginning in 2014, you had this just massive, like big bang effort. And um, it worked par partially for a, a small amount of time in part because the political system was so destabilized. But as soon as the political system, the coalition reformed, and you, know, you probably remember the famous phrase from Homero Juca, where he said, you know, uh, I forget what his ex exact phrase was, but it was essentially, Think is tanka esa sangria. You know we have to staunch the bleeding, um, and all we've seen since then is an effort to staunch the bleeding. And I, so, uh, what I'm trying to suggest here is that incrementalism has been the way in which change has typically happened in democratic Brazil, and I think that um, perhaps would be more successful over the long time, long term. But that's not to say that you couldn't have a very abrupt equilibrium shift if the incrementalism added up. Um, I, I also, you know, I've given a lot of thought since the book was published about what this would look like and like what, what would reform look like? And this goes to both of your comments and questions. I would start by, you know, agreeing with you, Tony, about decadent and developmentalism. I, I think maybe you could call it decadent neoliberalism. Um, I, and in fact, I presented uh, to some economists in Brazil and it was, a, it was a closed door meeting, but 
a fairly prominent economist, suggested exactly that along the lines of what you said. And um, I, I guess the, the defense of the term developmentalism is I think that the organizational structures of government in Brazil tend to be marked by this legacy of developmentalism. And so what you get is this very strange mix where, for example, privatizations are taken undertaken by the BNDES, by the National Development Bank. Um, you get regulatory agencies, which are a neoliberal in, uh, initiative, but they are at the same time created by their own, the ministries that they're supposed to control. They're designed by the very ministries that they're supposed to control. So you get this very strange mix that is heterodox um, and very different from the sort of classical cases of neoliberalism in Latin America, like Chile. Now, that's not to say that um, I am not advocating for neoliberalism. I, I think that you're absolutely correct, Tony, that you know the economic policy mix that most countries use today is a little bit of every world, right? I mean, um, these terms are, are a little bit outdated, uh, partly because there is not as much space anymore for the kind of um, developmental state that existed in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s when Japan, Korea, and other countries were really bursting out. Um, and so I, I agree with your point that large paradigms get in the way. On, that, on the other hand, I think if we return to the core question that Andresa asked, which is, how do we control elites? And that means control to prevent corruption, but it also means control to ensure that policy is achieving the desired aim. The thing that strikes me that has been missing and, and most um, absent over the course of the past 35 years is a national strategy. And partly that's the consequence of bad luck, uh, you know, hyperinflation is just a terrible bagunza, you know, it, it messes up the entire economic system, it makes it very hard to plan, it makes it very hard to think about a national strategy. Partly that's the consequence of the IPE factors that you talked about, Tony, I mean, I think this is a huge question that has, I mean, from the fixed exchange rate under the real plan, all the way through to you know, the fiscal situation under Dilma Rousseff. I mean, this is this is omnipresent, the pressure of international markets. And so this is a book that I I really at some point just said I've got to create a very narrow scope here and focus on the national. But other people, Daniela Campello and others, have done a lot of work on the IPE aspects of this. And, and so I would I would point you to that. And then finally, um, you know, in terms of what do the reforms look like that allow us greater control, both over corruption, over sort of political exchanges, over economic policy, over the regressivity of social policy. Here, again, I would return to incrementalism. People like Sergio Abranches have come out and said, we need a massive new reconstituent assembly, a new constitutional convention. And I just don't think that that is realistic. You know, Brazilians will decide, but what's to keep that from achieving, going back to the same bargain that was struck in 1988. And what we've seen is that through incrementalism, there have been a number of change, that changes that could continue over time. The clausula de barreira to try to limit the fragmentation of the political system. Uh, I think that there are reforms in process to try to increase the autonomy of regulatory agencies. I think anything that can be done to increase the autonomy of control agencies like the TCU, the uh, Accounting Tribunal, or the Comptroller General's Office, the anything that could be done to create a more stable and powerful pilot agency, uh, tax reforms that diminish the sort of defensive parochialism of the current tax system. And finally, you know, I think reforms to this, to the judiciary. And here, here is where, you know, I hope that the book makes a contribution by trying to think about all of these things in tandem in ways that we hadn't done in the past uh, because we're talking to our own little bailiwick. 
But I, I think that what we've seen over the course of the past decade, and particularly since Lava Jato, is that especially in, in the high courts, there is very, all of the incentives are towards fragmentation. All of the incentives are away from control over elites. Um, and there are plenty of things that could be done to make um, the judicial system function in a more coherent way that actually brought more, co more, more coherence to the economic policy paradigm. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Uh, one, one, one question we have here. Uh, could, you please, could you please uh, explain more closely the relationship between the inability to demand reciprocity for rents and the process of the, the coalition formation? I think that might be uh, one, one good question for us to, to, to end this, this discussion. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that the one of the things we see is both a fragmentation of the of of political structures, meaning that there are many access points, there are many veto points, there are many venues that can be used, but also uh, at the same time a coalition that is able to eliminate rivals. And so, you know, one another way to express this is with an example. And it kind of ties all of what I've been talking about together. And that's the example of the wiretap uh, that captured Aesio Neves talking to Juez Libachista. Aesio Neves, you'll remember, was a, a governor or senator from the PSDB, the opposition at the time. And he's talking to the president or CEO of a meatpacking company, uh, Juez Libachista. And Juez Libachista says to him, I want to I want to put um, uh, Benjini, the president, the former president of the Banco do Brasil, in as the president of the private sector company Vale. This makes no sense, right? A, a, a public sector figure from the opposition is talking to a private sector CEO about putting a public sector CEO into a private sector CEO position. And um, Aesio Neves says, you know what? I, I can't do that, but o vale é um mundo. Vale is a world. We can find, you know, the, the implicit assumption here is we can find a way to put him in here. And so in a world in which that kind of transaction is taking place, I hope, I, I hope that the example is clear about how there's this intermingling of elites, political, private sector, public sector, they're all intermingling. The opposition means nothing. The fact that Aesio Neves ran against Dilma Rousseff strikes me as, you know, almost ironic because this is immediately after that election. And yet he is powerful in some way because he retains power at the federal level, at the federative level in Minas Gerais and therefore over, IS, over Vale. And you can imagine that in that situation, a private sector company that is being asked to do something, that is to engage in a certain kind of innovation policy or to engage in investments that would improve human resources in areas in which Vale operates, could easily go to Aesio Neves and say, this is gonna break us. This is, you know, there are many reasons. This is, this is completely anti-capitalist. I can't do this. And who knows whether though the, you know, the government would be able to overcome those pressures. But the reason why I find that example so illustrative is it demonstrates that not only is the coalition at its core, the people who support the administration of the day, but it's also people who are supposedly in opposition, elites in opposition, who nonetheless know how, how the process works. And uh, in such a situation, it's very difficult for any executive especially an executive who's trying to govern a very fractious legislative, legislative branch to actually um, impose conditions on the use of the developmental state apparatus or developmentalist policies, or for that matter, even you know, neoliberal policies, quote unquote. So uh, I hope that that is a quick answer to your, to your question. Well, uh... This has been an amazing uh, discussion. Uh, I, I'm sure we all learned a lot today. 
So uh, on, on the behalf of uh, Brazil King Institute and the Department of Political Economy, I'd like to thank you, thank you all for, for joining. And uh, of course, a special thank you to, 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 to Dr. Matthew, Dr. Andresa, and Professor Anthony. Daniel? And I hope to Yes, yes, yes. Can I just, sorry, Vinicius definitely wanted me to say to thank on behalf of the Brazil Institute at King's uh, for the presentation, because I think Matthew's point initially about, you know, needing to step back and looking at an ensemble of, of institutions and how they complement each other, how they work together. That's, that's a fantastic lesson, for, I think, for all of us who, who, who work on Brazil. Thank you. Dr. Andres, I would like to, to make a final point. Uh, I, I'm sorry for, <laughs> for not asking before. No, no, I think it was all great. And um, I'm very happy to, to be part of this discussion. Thank you. So yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you all again. And uh, I hope to see everyone soon and take care. Thank you all. Bye.